All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you tonight for all the people you brought out. And Father, for those that are watching, I pray that you'll bless us tonight as we open your word. And Father, I pray that as we're gathered together in fellowship, that your spirit would be with us, that you would guide us and direct us. And Father, give us what we need for this evening to go out into this world that's changing rapidly. Father, I pray that you would give us courage, uh, put our armor on us so that we can go out and be your witnesses in our everyday life, that you would be glorified and that we pray your kingdom come as quick as possible. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to dig back into Ephesians. We're going to go to chapter two. So it's been what, eight weeks and we're on chapter two. It's pretty good. We're moving on. I told you I've, I've spent years in Ephesians before. So let's go over what we always go over. I like to kind of remind you the author is God. The writer is the apostle Paul. The audience is the church at Ephesus. Where? They're in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. The date of the writing is about 60 A.D. It was carried by Tychicus. The purpose was an explanation of the basic principles of Christians' walk in grace. An explanation of the basic principles of the Christians' walk in grace. So this is good for us. A lot of things we already know, some things we'll be reminded of, and maybe some things a light bulb will go off. Uh, an illumination. I like that as we figure out things. And, and sometimes, especially in like a lot of the Sunday school literature that, that the different places have been putting out for years, it just kind of hits the high spots. And so every once in a while, we just need to dig down and go through uh, verse by verse and just let the word of God speak to us. And, and I believe we have faith that it'll do, in fact, that. Um, Ephesians 1, 3 is a focal verse. It's blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places or in the heavenly. So this is a good promise. This is something good for us to hold on to. He has blessed us, those of us that are in Christ, we are blessed, present tense, in the heavenly places. And I think that's a great thing. A lot of times we can get, I've seen Christians that are, that are so uh, heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. So we need to just realize our standing and our state. Our standing is... We are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Our state is we're still here working in his kingdom. If we keep that as our focus, that our purpose for being here is to work in the Lord Jesus' kingdom now until he takes us home. And when he takes us home, we enter into rest, right? So we got to, just got to remember that. And then two verses we're going to probably hit tonight, I hope to anyway. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we, we get God's intent of post-salvation. It's not just about getting to heaven in, in the great by and by. It's also about what God has for us to do in his kingdom right now so if we keep that in mind we're going to do good so Ephesians 1 through 3 our doctrine Christology we're, we're rehearsing some things some basic principles Paul is revealing God's plan of salvation from the ages past through Israel and their history to now the New Testament with the Gentiles being included and that's the thing the crux of this book you have to think Gentile and Jew in the beginning of it and then he ties us all together going into chapter 2 and he teaches us what it means to be a child of God in Christ. And then the second part, 4 through 6, are our duty. It's an explanation of our response to this news that we are seated with Christ in the heavens. So, so we find out how we walk through this world um, in chapters 4 through 6. So remember verse 13. I believe 13 is a crux verse of chapter 1. And it says, in him you also, and I told you this is the big flip, because he's been saying we, 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 we. And then he says, in him you also. Now the rest of the book lets us know that he's referring to the Gentiles and how they're included in the promises of Israel now, but in the past it was all Israel. So we're going to see that later on. It's going to be a really big issue going into the, the, the latter part of this book about, about how the Gentiles are included and God's tore down the wall of partition that separated Jew and Gentile. He also tore down the wall of partition that separated humankind from God, and he did that with Christ Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross. And we're headed up to Resurrection Sunday, so you know we can focus on that cross and remember what he's done for us and this plan that God had before he ever made man, he had the plan. I like that. This was his plan all along because our God knew exactly how things were going to go. 
He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows everything there is to know. That's my belief about our Heavenly Father. I believe that he's omniscient. He knows anything that can be known. He knows it. He probably knows things that can't be known, but nonetheless. So it says, in him you also, talking to the Gentiles there at Ephesus, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So he kind of starts this statement here, in him you also. And then remember, last time we talked about, we, we entered Paul's prayer. So he, he kind of introduces this fact that you're in him sealed with the Spirit. I like that, sealed with the Spirit. You, you can't get lost again because God can't lose you. You're part of the body of Christ, we're also told in chapter 1. So this is a big deal. We're sealed with the Spirit the moment that we believe. It says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. You're then placed into him. You're also sealed with the Spirit of God, who is the guarantee. In other words, God put part of him in you. Fully God in you. You don't need another second blessing or a third blessing. You're not waiting for more God, and he doesn't leak off. He stays with us, never to leave us nor forsake us. That's a big deal to me. You'll hear me talk about eternal security a lot of the time because I believe the Bible teaches eternal security from the book of Concordance <laughs> all the way to the book of Maps. I think it just teaches eternal security. And, you know, that's my, you know, I know I got a lot of friends that don't believe that, and that's okay. They'll find out one day. So we get to chapter 2, and you'll notice something he does very distinct. He says, and you. So, so they, they kind of go together. Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember I told you, um, and I didn't figure it out. Other Greek people have figured it out, that from verse 3 of chapter 1 all the way through verse 23, it's one sentence. That's how Paul writes. So you've got to be willing to run out and chase rabbits when you're reading Paul. Well, same kind of things happen here. From 3 to 23, he was, it was a sentence. And then here, chapter 2, is another sentence. And it goes seven whole verses, his next sentence. So you got to think about Paul's thought process. That's why I said I want to try to do seven verses because it's one thought. Now, the Greek syntax is completely different than our English syntax. The way they wrote, how they used punctuation, which was very rarely. They didn't capitalize. So if you find a Greek document, if, you, if it's got capitalized words in it, if it's an ancient document, they're all capitalized. They're called, I think it's pronounced uncial or unical. They're all capitalized, everything in it. They also don't take spaces between words. Now try to figure that out. No spaces between words. When they got to the end of a line writing, because papyrus or paper or vellum was hard to come by, they didn't waste any of it. When they got to the end, no matter where they were in a word, they just started on the next line with that same word. So Greek goes left to right. Hebrew and Aramaic go right to left in the writing. And so when you find one that's got capital letters, they're all capital, typically, unless it's more recent. And if you find one that's in small letters, they're all small letters. Even if, it's, if, it, if it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, those are all small letters. That's just how it was written. So a lot of things are hard to figure out without punctuation and spaces because you can sometimes get a one word, or maybe that's three words. They're actually spelled the same. They mean different things. So, so studying and understanding scriptures is, is difficult at times. I'm glad I don't have to do it. I stand on the shoulders of other people that have done it, and I'm thankful for translations. Amen? Thankful that we have that. So here we are, chapter 2. And he says, and you, so we're coming back. So the previous one said, in him you also. And he talked about their salvation, how they became saved by belief and trusting on God. And then he says, and you also. So now he's going to refer to something else about these people. He says, and you also were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now here's something I want to focus on. Lost people aren't sick. They're not sin sick. They're spiritually dead. As a matter of fact, Corinthians says, you can't understand the scripture without the spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned. That's why we study. And, and, and well, there's a whole lot of people, that there's a whole lot of professors that know the Bible as literature. They don't have the spirit of God guiding them. And they may be able to define a word, but they don't believe in God or they don't believe this is a, a truthful document. They're not understanding it to the level that I believe that the most untrained, born-again believer can understand it because the Spirit of God we're sealed with lives in us, and He's the interpreter. That's why I say the writer's God. He's still alive. Amen? He's still instructing His saints on what we need to get. 
Now, I've had a lot of people come to me through the ages and say, I just can't understand the Bible like you understand it. And I'll say, well, do you understand anything? Oh, well, yeah, I understand a lot of it. I said, then stand in that and add to that. It's, it's one big, long story. I see the Bible as a big rope. It's one big, long story, but it takes a lot of study to kind of figure out how it fits. Uh, chronology of the Bible is another one of my favorite studies. Where do things fit and what was going on? So he says, and you also were dead in trespasses, which we said last last time or the week time before that or Sunday morning when I was talking about forgiveness trespasses is a step over a line you know what trespassing is I used the hunting illustration I got to a sign that says if you're found trespassing here tonight you'll be found here in the morning I understand what that sign meant went the other way <laughs> trespassing is crossing a line sin is not measuring up to the perfection of God now so sin is a big deal trespasses are a big deal but they both eat both equal the same thing in the human history and that's death spiritual death remember adam and eve god said in the day that you eat you will surely die and i've had unbelievers come to me and say and in the very next verse god's talking to adam he's talking to eve and they didn't die i'm like oh they most certainly did die their relationship with god died they died spiritually in other words the the definition for death that we get in james is separation it says, when the spirit is separated from the body, the body is dead. So there's a great definition for death right there. When the spirit leaves the body, the body is therefore dead. Well, when we understand death, we, we need to understand it biblically that death is separation. So when Adam and Eve ate, God still spoke with them, but they were spiritually dead. They needed a redeemer, which God promised Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He said, your seed, the future seed, is going to step on the head of the serpent's seed and and bruise it uh, he'll bruise the heel and the the serpent then will be crushed by that and that's the picture of jesus coming all those thousands of years later jesus came and defeated sin because he took sin on him at the cross it says he became sin for us he took our sin debt on him the bible says the wages of sin is death right so Death, separation from God, that's the wages of sin. And everybody born in the line of Adam is a sin by nature, sinner by nature, and a sinner by commission. I've known a lot of people that didn't believe they actually committed a sin. It's hard to get somebody saved if you can't get them lost. But I've known a lot of people that would say, well, I'm better than the deacon over at your church. Hadn't happened here. But I've heard that kind of saying before. I'm, I'm better than this person. I'm like, well, you're probably better than me, but that doesn't matter. If you're a sinner, you're separated from God. Well, I'm not a sinner. Well, you're not a sinner. You've never stole anything. You've never told a lie. Only when I needed to. Oh, so if you've told a lie, you're a liar. If you've taken a paper clip, you're a thief. So when it comes down to it, we're all guilty. We're all found guilty. And Paul wrote this out beautifully in the first three chapters of Romans. If you want to read Romans, read the first three chapters together at one city. He basically makes all the Jews a sinner, and he makes everybody else in the world a sinner, and then he says the wages of sin is death. So, I mean, Paul just kind of rolls along in Romans. He lets everybody know you're guilty. So, going back to the lost versus the saved. If you're a born-again believer in here today, you have already experienced a resurrection. You were dead. You're now made alive. And the scripture says this in many places. Um, I, I believe that there's going to be a physical re resurrection one day. I, I believe that, you know, those that die ahead of the rest of us when Christ comes back, that they're going to go first and meet him in the air, and we're going to join them, and we're going to ever be with the Lord, Thessalonians says, from that moment on. So I believe in a, I believe in a bodily resurrection. Christ was resurrected bodily, not spiritually. He was resurrected bodily. And, and the angels told the disciples when Jesus ascended, he said, this same Jesus is going to come back just like you saw him go. And it says that when we see him, we'll be like him. So whenever that happens, we're going to be like Christ. And I, I believe in a glorified body. That's a whole other sermon series for a whole other day. So he says, and you were dead, like the past tense there, don't you? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Now, a lot of people read that and say, well, then every time I commit a sin, I'm lost again. That's not what he's saying. He says, you once walked in these. This was your whole way of life. And that's the thing that people don't understand. They think that I'm going to live good. If I can live good 51% of the time when I, when I die, then God's going to receive me into heaven because I've done, I've done more good than harm. 
And the Bible says in Isaiah that your righteousness is filthy rags. And I won't go into that definition of what Isaiah really meant when he said that. But just understand that nothing you do, your best stuff is filthy, nasty rags to God. You have to be cleansed. So somebody that's dead doesn't need resuscitation. Won't do you any good. They need to be relivened. They need to be undead. They need to be resurrected. If you're dead, you need to be resurrected. And a lot of people think, well, I just need a Band-Aid. I just need to pray more. I didn't. No, you need Jesus. You need Jesus' forgiveness. You need the washing that comes from Christ to take away your sins. He put all of our sins on him. When we receive him as our Savior, the Bible says 2,000 years ago we died with him. And the life that we now live, we live in the faith of the Son of God who died for us. Paul says, I am crucified with him. Now think about that. As Christians, when Christ hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, we died with him. A lot of people can't understand that. But we've been raised to walk in the newness of life, the Bible tells us. So, so he says, you were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of the world. So there's some things that we can glean from this. Before we're saved, we're dead spiritually. Not sick, dead spiritually. We follow the course of this world. We go after the, the lust and the desires and our own will and our own mindset. We're going to do it my way. You know, I'm just going to do it my way. That's how God made me and all this other stuff you hear. This is following the course of the world. Not God's kingdom, but the course of the world, which is a no-no. It's not something that's God approved. Also, we follow the prince of the power of the air. Now, the prince of the power of the air is Satan. The devil, if you will. The prince of of the power of the air. It's amazing. There's a few places when it says that about Satan, that he is the God of this world, Jesus said. He's the prince in the power of the air. And when I think of the prince of the power of the air, I think about when Jesus was trying to cross the lake, Sea of Galilee, and the wind tried to sink the disciples. You remember that? He was asleep in the boat. And the wind, God's own creation, was against Jesus. And, and, the, and the sailors that were his disciples we're scared to death. And Jesus, they woke him up and said, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. What could happen? Was Jesus going to drown? No. He was going to the cross. He could walk on the water. What a thing for him. He knew. And what did he do? He stood up and he rebuked the wind. That always makes me think when I read that. He's a prince in the power of the air. I heard a preacher say one time, he edged a little bit more on the capital F fundamental side of things. He said, what you're hearing on the radios is coming through the air, all controlled by the devil. The things that are going on through the internet, all controlled. I don't think that's true. I love the internet. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. Music, I like all kinds. But it doesn't make me want to go worship Satan. Also, I used to play violent games, and I've never shot anybody. So, I, you know, I think that's all a bunch of malarkey. So, the following the prince of the air. So, that's what we, before we're saved, we actually follow. We're in that group. Nobody's in the middle. Nobody can say, I'm, I'm not committed, I'm not on either team. You're born on one team. And until you get saved, that's the team you're on. As you live your life, and until you receive Christ as your Savior, you're lost. Lost doesn't go away without the blood of Christ. This is a spirit that's now working the sons of disobedience. Disobedience. Among whom, listen to what Paul does here, among whom we all once lived. So Paul acknowledges that the Jews before Christ... And, and right then in his life, without Christ, we're lost. A lot of people don't believe that. But that's what it is. They need Jesus. I've often said, and, and probably it's you know, mean to say, but Jesus, uh, Mary needed a Savior. Mary needed her son to save her from her sins as well. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. What do we do? We follow the flesh. Well, you remember when Satan tempted Eve? We're told later on in John it was lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The lust of the eyes, we want what God doesn't want us to have. We covet. We decide this will be good for me, I want it, without actually it being something God wants us to have. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. We want to take care of our own desires. I have a desire, I want to meet that need. And the pride of life. I deserve this. Have you ever heard anybody say that? you ever heard anybody say, I deserve better? There's an ego problem there. 
It's hard to talk with people like that. So, so we lived in this according to the passions of our flesh. And the Bible says that's not how you get to heaven. You're not going to stand up right in front of God and say, you made me this way. You've got to let me in. He'll say, no, you sinned. You need a Savior. I sent my son. He took care of sin. And if you don't, if you don't receive his payment, when you stand before him, you've got to handle the debt yourself. Carrying out these desires of the body and the mind. This is how we are. We, we work things out in our own way. I've got friends that don't know Christ. And, and they've worked things out in their own way so that they can be a pretty good human being. And like Isaiah says, your righteousness is filthy rags. So Paul's telling them. He told them that, you know, I now pray for you. You also, you, you heard the gospel message. You received Christ as your Savior. You're born again believers. Then he comes down and reminds them of who, who they used to be. When they were dead in trespasses and sin, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature. See, that's a big thing today. By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So Paul is including himself, the Jewish nation, and all Gentiles in this same lump, which he did in, in Romans chapters 1 through 3. He lumps all of humanity in the same pile, dead in trespasses and sin, and they need a resurrection. And so that's what he's teaching here. You've been, you've been resurrected spiritually. You were dead. You're now alive in Christ. You were dead, and this was the way you lived. And one of the things that when how dead people, spiritually dead, live is they live according to their nature, which is an edemic nature. Until you get saved and that edemic nature is put on a back burner, you get, to, you get Christ's nature in you. We're told that in the New Testament, that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We get the nature of Christ in us. We get the mind of Christ, the Bible says, so we can actually think correctly. We may not choose to. But how many times have you heard somebody excuse their bad behavior or their sin behavior by saying, it's just my nature? The reply to that is, you need a new nature. You need a new nature. I've had people say, I have an anger problem. I got it from my father. So, well, you need a new father. God is willing to be your father. He'll change your nature to where your wanter, I like the way the old preachers used to say, he'll change your wanter. You'll want to do the things that honor Christ. Your will will conform to his will. That's why it says, if you ask according to my will, well, we've got to know God's will before we can ask according to his will. We have that about, they have that ability because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's teaching us and training us. So Paul just basically says, lost people are dead. There's no in between. He says, lost people are dead spiritually and they need resurrection just like these people at Ephesus were resurrected when they believed the truth about Jesus Christ. So if you're in here tonight and you've been born again, you've been resurrected. You're a new creature, the Bible says. Old things are gone. New things have come. Paul tells us that again in, in Corinthians. Old things are gone. Why? Because you have a new nature. That new nature is the nature of Christ. And I think a lot of times we Christians forget that we have the nature of Christ. And, and you heard the old Indian proverb, if you take two dogs and you only feed one of them, which one's going to win the fight? Same thing with Christians. We still have the idemic nature. But we now have the nature of Christ. And whichever one of those you feed is what's going to win the battles in your life. If we constantly do the things of the world and we get away from the things of God... We're going, to be, we're going to be stronger that way, and our spirit's going to be weak. We need to strengthen, we need to feed, we need to nourish our spiritual nature that's been made alive in Christ. And see, this is just a jumping off point. But this is just at salvation these things happen. I think it's a, it's a great way to word things. I like this. So we were dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We took care of our lust. We took care of our fleshly desires. We ran after the things of the world. We followed the prince of the air. This is who we were as lost people. But I love how this next one starts. But God. Anytime you see that in Scripture, you should stop and think, praise the Lord. But God, he didn't leave us there. You didn't have a choice in the matter. You were born into it. But God didn't leave us there. He sent his son. He said, but God being rich in mercy. Now, what do you understand about mercy? You know, you hear those two words, grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. I've heard grace defined as um, God's riches at Christ's expense, grace is simply getting something you don't deserve. Nobody in the world deserves God's home where Jesus is at. Nobody deserves it. Nobody has, or the best person you know 
the Bible says, has earned, the wages of sin is death. That's what you've earned. That's the payment. The best person you know. But God, not willing that we should live that way, was full of mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You ever been merciful with your children when they needed a whooping and didn't give them a whooping? I took the opportunity of that. When I would sit down, I would tell my kids, now, you, you did what I told you not to do or something, whatever it was, something all the time. And I said, you know, what, what's, what's our normal procedure here? I get a whooping. I get a spanking. And I said, well, tonight I'm not going to give you a spanking. You deserve one, but I'm not going to give it to you. Let me tell you what that word's called. It's called mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Now, a lot of times, especially in today's environment, nobody thinks they deserve anything bad. Nobody thinks that what they're doing is wrong. Nobody thinks that anything that they've done, they can just simply write it off and say, I didn't know, it's the way God made me, or just on and on and on and on and on. But God, being full of mercy, did not want us to die in our sins. He sent his son to die in our place on Calvary's tree, covered our sins with blood, which the Passover is a picture of. God is rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us. Now, here's what I love that, that Roman says. While we were yet sinners. That kind of blows the whole clean myself up, then go to church. I'm sure you've had somebody tell you that. I've had people tell me that. I walked up on a guy one time pitiful pitiful alcoholic he's no longer in, even in the world pitiful alcoholic i walked up to him in his trailer where he lived and as i was coming i saw he had i don't know some sort of beer and he put it behind him and this guy drunk 25 or 30 a night and so we walked up and we didn't talk long and i told him i said buddy your beer's gonna get warm better go ahead and drink it he said i don't want to drink in front of the pastor i said you drink in front of god every time you drink don't worry about drinking in front of me i don't want your beer to go cold i'm sure you spent money you didn't have on that beer and I, and I would invite him to church, and he said, I, I'm going to. I've got to clean up first. I've got to get my stuff together. And I would tell him, you can't get your stuff together. But I want to tell you something right now. God loves you in your drunken state. God loves you. He loves you even in your sins, even in your wickedness and wretchedness. God had so much mercy on you that he died for you while you were broken. Isn't that cool? I mean, you talk about the love of God and that mercy. That's something that, you know, we can shout hallelujah to. That, that right there is, just tells us why all of the Easter or the resurrection even happens is because God loved us enough to send his son. And they abused him. They treated him poorly. He was innocent and they convicted him. Everybody there knew he was innocent. They convicted him anyway. They wanted Barabbas, who they knew was a murderer, over Jesus. And everybody knew he had done nothing wrong he just said some things that the religious leaders didn't like. Even Pilate says, I find no fault. There's no fault. Everybody had heard of Jesus. They all looked forward to an audience with him. Pilate was excited about it. Then Jesus wouldn't say anything. He stood before him because his whole ministry spoke for what it was. And Pilate wanted to interview him. And Jesus wouldn't be made a puppet of. So it says, because of the great love which he loved us while we were yet sinners, even when we were dead... In our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. Remember, I told you all through this book, it's in Christ, in Him, in in the in the Son of God, uh, in the Messiah, with Christ. It's all through this book. It's all about being in Christ. In other words, when Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life," no man comes to the Father but by me. He meant it. A lot of people think Christianity is narrow-minded. We don't want anybody else to be a part of it. Just us four and no more. That's not the truth at all. We're narrow-minded because our master's narrow-minded. He's the one that said he's the only way. People are trying to find all kinds of ways up the mountain now. You've probably heard that. Well, there's many paths that lead to the top. Well, that's a good analogy of hiking, but that's not a good analogy of salvation. Jesus is the only way. He made us alive together with Christ, and he throws it at, for by grace you've been saved. It's grace getting what you don't deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So grace and mercy are mentioned right here in this passage. And raised us up with him. You'll hear the past tense in that? He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ, 
And 1 John 5 says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's really narrow in 1 John. If you've got Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have faith and trust in Him, you're born again. If you don't, you don't have Him. And you have no appeal process. He raised us up with Him. Past tense. When He raised Christ. Think about when Jesus hung on a cross and He said, Tetelestai, it is finished. What was finished? Everything. Not just crucifixion. Everything. In that moment, in that time, on the cross, He secured salvation for all mankind for all time. He secured that. And our inheritance was set in Christ in that moment. And when we have faith that Christ did what he said he did when he died on the cross. And he came back. That's a pretty marvelous feat in itself. He came back as proof that that actually was finished. So Paul can say, we were raised up when Christ was raised up. Because when he was raised up, all of his followers, or anybody that follows him, same resurrection, raised up with Christ. Now it's coming a day when we have the physical resurrection ourselves. But right now, as he said earlier in chapter 2, is you were dead, you're now alive. We've been raised up with him, resurrection, and seated us in him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so why did he do all that? Now, here's a great verse. Not sure exactly what it means. Because you can narrow it down to maybe one more age in the scripture, maybe two more ages. Some people narrow it down to a millennial age that's coming, thousand years. And then after that, you have eternity. That's another age. So two more ages. Some people say, well, there's just one age. There's before Christ and then after Christ. I don't know. I haven't decided on all that yet. But I do know that right here, Paul explains why God did what he did. Think about it. Go back to Genesis. And you read in the very first chapter of Genesis that God made everything and he made everything good. And then there's a verse that says, and it became chaos. It became broken. It, and that's what the actual Hebrew means. It became broken. Now, how that happened is a whole other sermon series. Chaos, and then God came in, breathed on it all, corrected it all, made everything brand new. You have kind of the same picture in our life. God comes into a mess, the primordial world, if nothing else, and he made it a lush garden paradise. That's the power of God. Then he came into your life. Before Christ, you were separated, isolated. You were dead in trespasses and sin. You were unsalvageable. You had no value except to God. He moves into your life, and he makes you into his temple. He loves you so much that he died for you while you were wicked. And then when you receive him as your Savior, he just moves in. He's like, this will work. I live here. He can live anywhere. He wants to live in us. We are the new temple of God. We are those living stones that have been built together for a holy habitation for God. We are the holy habitation for God. He moves into our life. He raised us up and seated him. All of this he's done. And it almost is so that everything in the future. Remember, we've already read in the first, first chapter to bring all things under the headship. To bring all things under the headship of God. He's come to fix what was broken. It's almost like it's some sort of cosmic battle because... Who's God doing this to see? But it says, look what it says. He says, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And, and I just think about all the other scripture. It talks about all this other stuff that's going on in the cosmos. And that God comes in to human beings. We're the most frail thing on the face of the earth. You take a horse born walking within minutes, right? I mean, they're up and running. Uh, you take a baby, baby, a baby zebra, you take a, a baby giraffe, they're moving quick because lions are out there with them. They're moving quick. And, and, and they're, they're, they're perfectly formed, smaller versions of what they're going to be big versions. Then look at a human. Head's so big, they can't hold it up. We're born without anything. We, we don't finish in the cooking process. We're born completely dependent. We're the weakest animal born on the face of the earth. But when we mature, we can change the way the world looks. We have a huge brain. And it gives us this unbelievable ability to think and to process and to, to, to do things. And it's this huge brain that we have. And our body can't even hold it up. 
I mean, you say, you, you say your kid's walking at nine months. Well, that's something. I've seen them walking at 13 months. You know, I mean, we don't even motor very well. We have to have our moms and our dads. We have to have somebody looking after us before we can go any further. And you think about, this is who God died for. But the, you know, smartest animal, but the weakest, most frail. We're, we're an animal that gives in to temptation. We're, we're an animal that, that can deny the existence of God. We're an animal that'll do things outside of our design and think that it's okay. We're, we're that, and we're the animal he died for. So he comes into an absolutely wrecked race, the human race. He moves into our lives, and he makes us his abode. He says, I want to live in Rusty. I'm like, really? It's not clean yet. He said, I'll take care of it. He moves in, and then begins cleaning. And he begins cleaning out those little closets that we don't want nobody to know about. He begins working in those things that we hold on to that, that, that you know, we try to deny or even there. He gets into, I mean, you got a mind. You know where it'll go. If it's anything like my mind, it's, it's, it's amazing things that we can think of. It's amazing things we can do, and it's unbelievable the things that we can say. I mean, I've had a dog bark at me. No big deal. It's a dog I expect him to bark, but I've had people hurt me. I've had people hurt me. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones. Words will never hurt me. Pfft. Ain't no truth in that. Throw the sticks. Yeah. Throw the rocks. But you ever been thrown under the bus by somebody? Have you ever been dropped? You thought you had a friend and come to find out you didn't? I mean, it's just amazing how evil we can be to one another. We're the only ones here. I mean, there's only humans on the earth. It's not like there's another species of alien, although it depends on what you watch on TV. Some people think so. And yet God said, I'm going to show off my handiwork. I'm going to take this miserable group of sinners and trespassers and God deniers, and I'm going to turn them into something beautiful. And I'm sure that the, the evil horde would say, you really don't care for those humans. And God says, they're my peculiar possession. And then as we read last week, we are his inheritance. We're the inheritance of God. Because of what Christ did on the cross, God inherits us. And I always think, he didn't get much when he got me. And he says, oh, no. I love you, Rusty. You're my favorite of all the humans. So you're all listening. I just didn't know. I love you. You're special to me. Has anybody ever not felt special? Yeah. I'm one of those. I can disappear in a room. There'll be a room full of people. People say, was Rusty here? Not at church because I'm the pastor. Everybody notices the pastor. But just in general. Just feel invisible. You ever felt invisible? That's a bad feeling, y'all. You ever felt like you don't matter? You ever felt like nobody wants your opinion? You ever felt like nobody's listening? See, we forget sometimes that God dodes on us. He died for you. He loves you. It's an individual thing. It's not just a class or a group. Anybody that'll say, God, I am so lonely. I'm so destitute. I'm so wicked. I cry out for salvation from you. And he says, come on, my child. Have a seat on my lap. Call me daddy. And he says, anytime we call his name, I mean, can you imagine what all God hears? I mean, can you imagine the din that God can hear? First of all, he's got those crazy angels that shout, holy, 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 around the clock. And he's got those 24 elders that are bowing down and casting crowns, and it's all going on in front of his throne, the Bible says. And on top of that, you've got prayers around this globe. And then you've got all the crickets. I believe he can hear them all. And then there's the babbling brooks. He can hear everything. But when I say, dear Heavenly Father... He locks in on me in that moment and says, what is it, child? Isn't that precious? I matter. 
I'm, I'm important to God. And I want you to understand you're important to God. You matter. So that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace. He's had grace on me. He said, grace on me. I don't deserve God's riches. But he lavishes them on his children. And, you know, one of the things I don't think a lot of Christians that I've spoke with through the years understand is how much God loves you. We think, well, you don't understand what I've done. Yeah, God knows it all. And he chose to die for you anyway. Ah, oh, but you don't know what I've said recently. God knew it all. And he died anyway. While we were yet sinners, while we were plucking his beard, spitting on him, stabbing his side, piercing him with the throne of thorns, while we did all that, and all that was going on, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am, but they will. And then when he said, to tell us die, it is finished. He secured salvation. For eternity. For me. And anybody else that will call upon the name of Jesus, he gives them all the stuff, and you don't even know what all's in the brochure yet. I mean, it's a pretty complicated brochure about what God's like and what he's got for us. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, it has not entered into the mind of man the things that God has for us. Eye hath not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has for us. You can't even think about. You can't even encapsulate the good things that God has for you because he loves you. And he's going to show us off. It says so right there. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. I, it's, it's, just, it's just like, you, you've seen Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory? He couldn't wait to show off all of this stuff. I just pictured God being that way with us. Because <laughs> he knows I love Saturn. So I know he's going to say, hey, come with me. I want to show you the rings. We're going to walk on the rings. I'm like, I'm down for that. Let me, let me show you these hidden mysteries. You want to know why there's gravity? I'd love to know why there's gravity. Why do we stay here? I've heard it explained. It makes no sense. I want God to explain to me gravity. Because that's a neat invention that he created that affects time. Gravity affects time. You wouldn't think so, but it does. Einstein proved that. I don't know if I believe all that, but nonetheless, Einstein believed and proved that time is affected by gravity. Nonetheless, God is so proud of you that you're going to be his prized possession. You know prized possession like you said on the mantle? You put it up high because you don't want the grandkids to tear it up because they're way worse than your kids were, right? You put those things up so that you can keep them because they're prized possessions. That's what you are to God. And that's what Paul is explaining. You were dead. And God made you alive. And he seated you in the heavenly places. He's coming back for you. And he listens to you whenever you cry. Whenever you call out. He hears you. You've heard it said several years ago, Bailey Smith, one of the Southern Baptist president at the time, said God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jewish person. He said that. God doesn't hear the prayers of a lost. And I would come back and I would say, I know what you're trying to say, but here's what I believe. He's not obligated to hear the prayers of a lost. Not obligated. He didn't have to. He obligated himself to all those that are his children. When you pray, he obligates himself to listen to you. And he has three answers. Yes, no, and wait. But you always get an answer. Always get it. You may not accept the answer, but you get an answer because he knows the beginning, from the, the beginning from the end. He knows what's good for you and what's not good for you. I've asked God for lots of money lots of times. He knows I can't handle it. I asked him for a singing voice. He knows I can't handle it. Our God loves us so much. I think I'm going to close right there tonight. End of verse 7. So that's the end of that first sentence in chapter 2. That's one sentence, y'all. That's crazy, isn't it? So let's have a word of prayer, then we'll have a time of discussion, and we'll go over our prayer list. Father God, tonight I want to thank you for the passion that I hear in Paul, the way he wrote this. And Father, I just thank you for 
loving us, loving me enough that you died for me. I thank you for the riches of your grace. I thank you for mercy, for not giving me what I deserve. Father, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for making me. Thank you for placing me in your kingdom work. Father, help us to open our eyes to the greatness in your riches and in your possession. We belong to you. And we submit to your rule and your guide and your authority. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.